This next lecture is on regeneration, justification, and sanctification. We'll start talking about regeneration. A couple of definitions for regeneration from Queen Grudem. Regeneration is a secret act of God in which he imparts new spiritual life to us. The Concise Dictionary of Christian Theology defines regeneration as the work of the Holy Spirit in creating a new life in the sinful person who repents and comes to believe in Christ. The Westminster Dictionary of Theological Terms defines regeneration as the action of the Holy Spirit who transforms the lives of those given the gift of faith so that they experience a new birth and salvation through Jesus Christ. If you notice here, <clears throat> we have a number of uh, a, a good bit of agreement in the way that our definition is described. Regeneration is God's action, and particularly the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> And it is about us being made to live anew. So we see that again. And some of these um, also make a comment, as in the Westminster Dictionary, that the gift of faith is described there, which fits in with a conception of Reformed theology, that faith is imparted uh, as a gift from God, and that humans don't have uh, as much to do with it there. When we look into the New Testament, uh, we see the word for regeneration, palingenesia, is only twice used, and once uh, referring to a cosmic regeneration in Matthew 19.28. And Jesus, so Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, no one in the regeneration, uh, that in the regeneration when the Son of Man sits on his throne in glory. So we see that phrase there in more of a cosmic sense, and then we're specifically as uh, a for Christians, for individuals here, uh, in Titus 3, 5, not by works of his righteousness, which we have done, not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so we see uh, two concepts there. One is related to a very broad cosmic sense, and the other is to an individual sense. Now, <clears throat> that particular word, and uh, I have to apologize for my allergies affecting my uh, ability to speak as I'm recording this, we have a couple of synonymous concepts also in the New Testament, and uh, we have this idea of to be born again or new birth. They are synonymous concepts, but they don't use the exact same word. In John 3.3, through 8, we see that uh, we have a new birth from above, that is from a divine origin rather than a human achievement, so it's contrasted with the, the idea of being born in the sense that we are all born as humans. The uh, new birth is said to be a work of the Holy Spirit, so particularly there. Ephesians 2.5, even when we were dead in trespasses, uh, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved, so we've been made alive there in Ephesians 2.5. The Holy Spirit is the one who is imparting life to a soul which is dead in trespasses and sins. And uh, we have a couple other references here to John and 2 Corinthians. <clears throat> also in the New Testament, we see that faith is, ne is necessary. Though faith is not the means of regeneration, it is a necessary requirement on the part of man for the Spirit to perform the miracle of the new birth, and a couple of references here in John, Ephesians, and Hebrews. So faith is not how one is regenerated, but it's a necessary requirement before God regenerates a person. So we need to make that uh, pretty clear. I think in our discussion of faith in the previous lecture, we noted that. Also, um, Hearing God's word or having access to the gospel, to God's word, is important for regeneration. And so uh, we see this in James 1, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verses 18 and 21. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls." So we see an importance here of connecting what God has commanded and what he has provided for in his word with the concept of faith. 
So they're very closely related. Uh, continuing in 1 Peter 1.23, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. The word of God is necessary for salvation in the sense that a person must know what to believe. So you can't focus on the idea of salvation apart from some kind of a content of what salvation is all about. There has to be some uh, communication of <clears throat> the, our, the human condition, what God has done to rectify that, and our uh, reliance and dependence upon him in that regard. In Romans uh, 10, 17, we see that, uh, so then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So the word of God, like faith, is necessary, though strictly speaking, it is not the means of regeneration. So faith and is not the means of regeneration, neither is God's word. It is the work of the Holy Spirit that's the means of regeneration. But it's certainly vital for us to be regenerated, to be saved, that we have God's word. If we did not have that, we wouldn't know what it is we're talking about and why salvation is important. Now, regeneration is an instantaneous event. It's a discrete event that happens at a particular point in time, and uh, there is a before and an after as we relate to the idea of regeneration. But just because it's an instantaneous event does not mean that it's a very quick event. The process leading up to regeneration may take a long time. Someone may, as a young child, be exposed to the gospel and start on a path that eventually years later results in them coming to faith and being saved and regenerated. And so the process leading up to that instantaneous point, let's say that at 10 they start to understand the gospel and at 25 they actually become a Christian and they are saved at that point. So that 15-year process would not be regeneration itself, but it would be this preparatory stage, this part of the process leading up to regeneration. But at 25, when they were converted, that would be this discrete, instantaneous event where they were given new life. So we don't want to confuse the process that brings someone to the point of regeneration with a process of regeneration that would be, in some sense, maybe seen as a 15-year process in this one case. So what we would say is the act of regeneration, when God gives new life to the person, is a discrete event, but there are preparatory processes, there are things that lead up to that. And that can take a lot of time, or it may not take very much time. It really depends on how responsive the person is to what God is leading them through. So, um, conversion and regeneration contrasted. <clears throat> uh, we don't have a whole lot of time to, to go through all of the different things about conversion and regeneration, but we're going to use Lewis and Damaris to show a few differences, five of them. Um, first of all, conversion is primarily a human act, even though the ability is from God. According to uh, Lewis and Damaris, regeneration is exclusively an act of God, the Holy Spirit. This means that conversion is synergistic while regeneration is monergistic. Now, synergistic simply means that we have a cooperation with God in that process, that it is uh, involving human and divine activity. And monergistic means that there's only one actor, and that would be God. So, while conversion, which is faith and repentance, certainly includes human actions, regeneration results from that, and that is simply the act of God. Uh, Ezekiel, we see uh, 36, 26 and 27, I will give you a new heart and put, in, put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your, uh, your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put, in my, put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. We see that God is taking the initiative here. The next point is, in conversion, the Holy Spirit works indirectly through human witness. In regeneration, the Holy Spirit works directly wherever he The reference for that is John 3, 8. So, 
conversion requires or has aspects of human proclamation of the word, sharing your faith with individuals, or encountering people, discussing events related to salvation. But uh, the Holy Spirit is active in regeneration um, without these um, acts of other humans. So he is uh, he does his acts directly then when he chooses to. And he works indirectly through people in the process leading up to that. But regeneration in, uh, in conversion is indirect, and, and regeneration is a direct work. The next point is that whereas conversion involves conscious travail, regeneration occurs beneath the level of consciousness. So what this is saying is that in the process leading up to someone having a conversion experience where they repent of their sins and they trust in Christ, that is something that can have a lot of um, emotional um, effect. It is something that you think about, that you're contemplating, you're counting the cost, all of these different things that are involved. This is a conscious decision. Regeneration is an act that is not a conscious act. We don't have like a switch that's flipped and we say, oh, I have just been regenerated. That is something that God does on our behalf to us, but it's not a conscious event like the point of us coming to faith. So, um, the process, number four, the process leading up to conversion may take a shorter or longer period of time. The gift of new life is received at a specific point in time, though we may be unable to identify it. So, this is kind of what we were talking about a little bit earlier. The point where someone seeks to understand and learn and come to a decision about trusting in Jesus or whether they are going to accept or reject what God has offered to them is a, a process that takes place over periods of time. For some people it's longer and others it can be much shorter. But regeneration is not a process, it's an instantaneous event. So that's a particular point of time. It's not a process. So, again, it's a discrete moment when that takes place. And finally, conversion expresses an initial response to Christ. Regeneration permanently renews the moral image of God uh, in the human and provides for lifelong perseverance. So conversion is our initial beginning on the process of san towards sanctification and our ultimate destiny. Regeneration is... A, it's not a process either in getting to regeneration or after regeneration, a process continuing after. It's just a, an instantaneous event where we are made new and then it allows us to, because of that new life we have in God, to persevere. So regeneration we need to see as a discrete point and we can say that uh, there is a moment prior to conversion uh, and regeneration, rather, there's a moment prior to regeneration in this whole conversion process, and then regeneration uh, happens, and then there are moments after regeneration. But regeneration is an instantaneous point in time that has a permanent effect. And so that's probably the best way that we should think about regeneration. Next, we're going to turn to justification. Uh, another quote from Lewis, uh, from, from one of the writers of the uh, Lewis and Damaris systematic. Uh, Reformation Protestantism regards the doctrine of justification by faith as a crucial article of the Christian religion upon which the gospel absolutely stands or falls. Grudem defines justification as an instantaneous legal act of God in which he, one, thinks of our sins as forgiven and Christ's righteousness as belonging to us, and two, declares us to be righteous in his sight. So there's a two-part definition here. One is uh, a, a, an act of treating us as if we are forgiven, and then a declaration of being righteous. The Concise Dictionary of Christian Theology, which again is Erickson's uh, text, is uh, his dictionary. Justification is defined as the doctrine. In the doctrine of salvation, the declaration that the human has been restored to a state of righteousness in God's sight. 
So both here, you will see, have a declarative aspect. This is something that is being declared to be the case. The Westminster definition uh, from the Westminster Dictionary of Theological Terms, Justification. God's declaring a sinful person to be just on the basis of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The result is God's peace, God's spirit, and thus salvation. And in the Catechism of the Catholic Church in the second edition, we find justification defined as the gracious action of God, which frees us from sin and communicates the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Justification is not only the remission of sins, but also the sanctification and renewal of the interior man. Now, what you'll notice here is that the Catholic concept includes aspects that are not found in Protestant definitions. You see that the justification, the last part, justification is not only the remission of sins, but also the sanctification and renewal of the interior man. In a Catholic understanding of justification, there is not a splitting apart of the concept of justification. Both sanctification and justification are seen as a as a complementary, as a single process. And Protestantism takes and sees justification as one thing that's going on and sanctification as another. So we're going to talk about that as we go along. So some different views of justification. Uh, in a Pelagian and liberal view, God just regards uh, as just and worthy of fellowship those who, who are inspired by Jesus as example to improve themselves morally. So the idea of you being the best person that you can is uh, what is justifying you before God. That's a concept there in some liberal theologies. In a Roman Catholic view of justification, it's the process of becoming just. It is the infusion of righteousness. Justification is accomplished through the merit of worthiness, i.e. the merit wrought by free moral acts performed in the state of grace. This leads uh, to an oxymoron of merited grace. Of course, if grace is unmerited favor, how would you have merited unmerited favor? That's what we're talking about there. So, again, a Catholic view of justification is one that includes sanctification in it. And there is a concept of being empowered by God to do good works, which then count for you, <coughs> excuse me, and toward your um, sanctification, your process of becoming more uh, like Christ. So, uh, continuing on this thought a little bit, giving some historical perspective, Augustine interprets diaku uh, or as make righteous rather than declare righteous. So some will say um, he was a poor Greek student. And we see that uh, justification and sanctification are put together along with regeneration under this concept of justification. So ju regeneration and sanctification and justification are all bundled together in a way that uh, particularly Reformed thought and, and Protestant thought has separated them into different aspects. And for those not yet perfect, their justification is completed in purgatory. So it, and we see uh, admonition and grace referenced there. The Council of Trent takes a, as a response to the Reformation. It says, if anyone says that the sinner is justified by faith alone, meaning that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to obtain the grace of justification, let him be an anthema. And um, that's in the ninth canon. The doctrine of imputed righteousness was seen as undermining moral effort. Now, in just a moment, I'm going to read an article that are portions of an article that deal with how the Catholics view the Protestant understanding of justification. I think it's very helpful for us to see how a Protestant view of justification is explained by someone who does not hold to it, because it will point out some of the big differences between a Protestant and Catholic view of justification. Along with this, you have what are called works of supererogation. This means that there's surplus merits that can be earned 
by the saints, <clears throat> and they can be transferred to ordinary believers. Mary, in particular, contributes to the justification of the faithful, and so is sometimes referred to as a co-redemptrix. Now, I'm going to try to pull up a whiteboard here, if I can do that. Let's see. Navigate. Add text. All right. Show highway. There we go. All right, so I'm going to try to draw an example here of how Catholic theology treats this concept. So let me see. Well, that's a very bad line. I'm trying to make a straight line here, and uh, I'm using a mouse, so it's going to be, um, like all of my illustrations, it's not going to be very, very good here. So let me try to do this. All right, so let's think of this as time. Whoops. I don't know what happened. Okay. And let's say this is when you were born, birth, and this is going to be death here. This is when the person dies. We're going to use a, uh, uh, we'll use blue here just for that. Okay. So this is, uh, that's when someone dies, and it should be straight, and I'm sorry that I can't draw straight with a mouse. Okay, and then up here, I want to use a different color. We'll use yellow. We'll say this is um, complete sanctification. If you are completely sanctified, that would be this point right here, this yellow line. Okay, so you can, let's, and with this, we're going to trace out someone's life. Okay, so you're born, and uh, you grow, and you, uh, you start to have the ability to, to make moral decisions. Some of them are good. Some of them are bad. Okay, and let's say that at this point right here, actually, let me erase that one. Let me just use a different color. At this point here, I'm going to make a cross. I'm going to try to make a cross. Okay. At this point right here is when um, a person becomes a believer. Now, in Catholic tradition, it's going to be very early on, most of the time, right? Shortly after birth, <clears throat> you're going to be baptized into the church, okay? And that is going to be a similar type of thing. So assume that you know the normal state for a normal Catholic would be over here. But let's say this was someone who was older, and then they become a Catholic. They become part of the, the Catholic Church there, okay? So it's later on in life when they become a believer. They become um, a Christian. But you still have ups and downs. You still have times where you do better and times where you fall off. But ideally here is that the trend is going to be basically upward, okay? But at some point, you hit the blue line, which is your death, okay? So, what we got here are your, um, your level of sanctification, maybe your storehouse of merited um, works, those kind of things. This is, this is your value, so to speak, as in, in trying to attain this gold line, which we'll call the beatific vision, which basically means uh, being uh, in heaven. So, if you are... Above this line, you have sufficient justification and sanctification to attain heaven. Okay, so that's the that's what is going on there. But at this point, you die. Now you're out of luck, right? Because you you did not have enough goodness, enough sanctification to be in heaven, and now you're dead. So what happens? Well, this is where Purgatory has an opportunity to allow someone to have a continued progress here. And I'm making this as flat of a slope as I can because most of the time the discussions of purgatory are such that it's a very, very long time for someone to reach the beatific vision to have uh, enough sanctification happening in purgatory for them to be able to be admitted into heaven. But at some point, 
here, you will actually cross that threshold, and then you will have attained the beatific vision. Okay, so this is a deficit here, so I'm going to use, uh, I'll just use a green highlighter here to say this is a deficit that is needed to reach uh, the beatific vision. Okay, now this would be the standard person's life. This would be really what um, most Catholics would under how they would understand salvation it is something like this if, if they've had sufficient training and understanding of what the church teaches. So even even the popes won't say that when they die or even uh, that when they die they will be in heaven, right? And there's there's reasons for that because they're they're not able to. However, once someone is has died, you can pray for them. And so what you can do is if you have enough prayers and things like this, what you might be able to do is shorten this time that it takes for them to exit purgatory. Okay? Now, that's the situation that's going on here. That's why you'll have um, different rites for those who are already deceased. That's why you'll have in Catholic churches lighting of candles and prayers for the deceased because they're trying to help get mama or grandma out of purgatory and get them on into heaven. So, now this is the standard kind of the regular person's life, but what about the saints? The saints uh, are a little bit different here. So, um, let me see if I can use a uh, different line. I'll use the green line. Let's say that we had um, had a saint here, and uh, this was a particularly good uh, saint, and um, this person. Uh, oops, that shouldn't I shouldn't have clicked there. Okay, this this person had a particularly good um, good life, and they. Uh, there we go. Let me see if I can extend my lines a little bit. All right. So this person um, maybe uh, they just had a very good life. Now um, let me get the highlighter portion. Now I'm going to highlight this with pink just because I want it to to be clear. Just the difference. So this area right here. Is this is this is a point prior to their death here, where they attain sufficient sanctification to reach the beatific vision. Okay, so they are now have all the sanctification that they need to be in heaven, and they've got all of this extra here, and this is called works of super erogation. Okay, these are surplus merit that this person does not need to be in heaven. It's extra merit that they have earned throughout their life. Okay, And so the idea is that this belongs to that saint. This is their works of supererogation. This is their stuff. And this little guy down here, who has not been as good, can pray to this saint and ask for some of this surplus merit here to be transferred to them. Or you could pray to the saint and say, give some of this merit to my grandpa so, <clears throat> so that he's not in purgatory as long. So you have a petitioning of the departed saints requesting for their help, and this is what it's talking about, transferring some of their merit or giving it to those who are in need. Okay? So that is this idea. Well, what, one more case I want us to talk show real quick. Uh, and we will use yellow, because that seems to be like the best option we have left. Uh, what about Mary? Okay, because Mary is a unique case in the Catholic Church. And Mary's uh, line would be something like this. And we're just gonna, I'm just gonna put an arrow on there, right? Because I don't have enough scale here to do this. Um, and with one exception, that in most uh, Catholic thought, we're going to see that Mary, this is birth, remember. This is Mary here. This is going back to conception. 
This is going back to talking about uh, when Mary was conceived. The Catholic position is going to be that at the moment of conception, the Immaculate Conception, which refers to Mary, not to Jesus, means that at the moment that Mary was conceived, she was given the same grace that everyone else gets at baptism. And because of that, she lived a life uh, without having the uh, some of the, the same issues that others have. And you see here, Mary's line is pretty much straight at a, at a slope upward. And you have Catholic teaching that will say that Mary um, herself did not sin, or at least, you know, some discussions uh, of things like that. So if we look here, that, uh, let me get the highlighter again here, Mary has lots of works of supererogation, much more than the regular run-of-the-mill saint here, much more than those who are needing here. So this is why Mary is often prayed to and asked for help, because she has so much uh, available works of supererogation, because she very early on qualified for the beatific vision. She didn't have to, you know, that's, that's there. So and she had a vast amount of works of supererogation. So that is a Catholic view of justification and sanctification. Now, let's see if I can uh, switch back here. Okay, good. Maybe we can easily go back to that again. So, hopefully that helps us to see some of the differences in how, uh, helps us to see how Catholics understand this justification-sanctification process. We will draw, I will draw a, a Protestant view in just a few moments. As we continue at looking at different views of our uh, justification, the Arminian view, uh, we see the Remonstrants interpreting justification in the light of the governmental theory of the atonement. And so the uh, the whole idea of the tulip comes out, out of a discussion or conflict between uh, certain reformers and the Remonstrants. We see a denial of imputation there in Arminial, uh, Arminian rather uh, theology. Justification does not involve the imputation of Christ's righteousness to believers. So the justification is not viewed in a um, in a forensic way where it's counted on our behalf here. You have Charles Finney who calls it uh, legal fiction, basically, that uh, for sinners to be forensically pronounced just is impossible or absurd. This idea of being declared just when you are not really just is uh, the problem. And the claim is that the Reformed view leads to antinomianism, and that is a, a disregard for the law, so a violating of, of the law. There's no laws, and they don't apply, and that kind of thing. There's a necessity of consecration in the Arminian view. God freely pardons those who ask for forgiveness and reform their lives. In other words, God declares righteous the persons who are righteous. So there's an idea that the righteousness that an individual has has to actually be a form of righteousness not simply a declaration of being righteous. A Reformed and Evangelical view is that the justification is the legal act of God by which he declares the sinner righteous on the basis of his relationship to Jesus Christ and his finished work. Now, we're going to go back here, I hope. Um, No, how do I get back to that? Okay, now if I can get a new one. All right, so let's go ahead and recreate our chart here the best we can. Okay, um, that's the one line. Let's say the yellow is, oh, that's kind of crooked here. Well, I can't seem to make a straight line, but that should be straight. Um, and then we had a blue line for death, I believe, here. Okay, so this is death. Okay. This is birth. This is the beatific vision, or going, you know, going to heaven. Being uh, fully justified. 
and that kind of thing. Okay, and so a person is born, um, and they have different aspects of the justification process, and they end here at death again. And let's say this person is, um, let's say right here is when they become a believer. Okay. Now, what are some of the differences between the Catholic version, the Catholic view, and the Protestant view? Well, at this point, this would be conversion. And so all of these aspects, regeneration, all of that stuff uh, happens here. At this point, and I'm just going to try to make a little bit of a dotted line here. At this point, we are declared righteous, right? That we are declared righteous, declared just. All right, let me see if I can clean that up a little. So, we are not actually just, but God counts it as if we are just. Okay, so at this point, we know that if something happens here and you don't, your death, your line has moved way back here, you're still counted as just. Okay. So, uh, as far as justification here, that justification is completed. So I'm going to put a J for justification. Okay. Now this part from here on is sanctification. So sanctification, put an S. Sanctification. Okay. Now of course, with justification, regeneration happened as well, so we put the R here. But with the Catholic view, all of these, let's see if I can go back to the previous kit page, is that, that right? All of this, you had justification, sanctification, and regeneration all together here. Okay? They were all together in this, in a Protestant view, justification is an instantaneous act. Regeneration is an instantaneous act. But sanctification is this process of becoming mature and becoming more Christ-like. And it has its ups and downs and its valleys. And again, the difference is going to be, upon death, there's going to be a significant difference. Because upon death, we will be then fully sanctified. Okay, so there's no need for purgatory over here, because upon death, we are then brought up and made to be what we were already declared to be in justification. So at, upon death, we are made to be what we were declared to be in justification. So this is how the Catholic view is different from the Protestant view, because in a Catholic view, you are actually becoming more holy. And that actual change in your holiness is important. In a Protestant view, or in a particularly a Reformed view, you are counted or declared righteous. You're regenerated. These are discrete events that happen, but they have, they have effects that linger, that go on. Your sanctification process continues, and it's imperfect, and it won't be completed upon your death, but upon your death, you will be made what you have been declared. So I hope that helps a little bit uh, as uh, we are going on through uh, to understand the differences between a Protestant and a Catholic view of regeneration and justification and sanctification. So the, the Catholics don't separate regeneration, justification, and sanctification. And Protestants, we separate all three. So uh, our understanding of what happens in salvation differs. Now, I have an article, or part of an article I'm going to read. The article is entitled, entitled Justification, and it's from the Catholic Encyclopedia, which is at newadvent.org. It's a very good resource to, to be able to look up Catholic perspectives on different positions. And in this article... I am going to read a portion of the Protestant doctrine on sanctification. I'm not going to read all of it because there's several large paragraphs before uh, I get to it. And this I accessed back in 2007, but I believe this is an older encyclopedia, so it ought to be, uh, be staying on. But one of the things that they do is they really show, I think, a good contrast between a Catholic view and a Reformed view 
of justification, but it's the Catholics describing it, so they're not describing it very positively, the differences. And so hopefully it helps us to see and understand more our view of sanctification when compared to the Catholic view by hearing it from words that come uh, from uh, the pen of a Catholic author. So I'm going to read this. It's a little bit extended, but uh, bear with me, and then we'll uh, have this as a reference that we could have in a class discussion. When is the part assigned to faith in justification? According to Luther and Calvin also, the faith that justifies is not, as the Catholic Church teaches, a firm belief in God's revealed truths and promises, but it is the infallible conviction that for God's that God, for the sake of Christ, will no longer impute to us our sins, but will consider and treat us as if we were really just and holy, although in our inner selves we remain the same sinners as before. This so-called fiduciary faith is not a religious moral preparation of the soul for sanctifying grace, nor a free act of cooperation on the part of the sinner. It is merely a means or spiritual instrument granted by God to assist the sinner in laying hold of the righteousness of God, thereby to cover his sins in a purely external manner as with a mantle. For this reason, the Lutheran formularies of belief lay great stress on the doctrine that our entire righteousness does not intrinsically belong to us, but is something altogether exterior. The contrast between Protestant and Catholic doctrine here comes very striking. For according to the teaching of the Catholic Church, the righteousness and sanctity which justification confers, although given to us by God as efficient cause and merited by Christ as meritorious cause, become an interior sanctifying quality or formal cause in the soul itself, which it makes truly just and holy in the sight of God. In the Protestant system, however, remission of sin is no real forgiveness, no blotting out of guilt. Sin is merely cloaked and concealed by the imputed merits of Christ. God no longer imputes it, whilst in reality it continues under cover its miserable existence till the hour of death. Thus there exist in man side by side two hostile brothers, as it were, one, the one just and the other unjust, the one a saint and the other a sinner, the one a child of God, the other a slave of Satan, and this without any prospect of a consolation between the two. For God, for God by merely his judicial absolution from sin does not take away sin itself, but spreads over it as an outward mantle his own righteousness. The Lutheran and Calvinistic doctrine on justification reaches its climax in the assertion that fiduciary faith, as described above, is the only requisite for justification, as long as the sinner with the arm of faith firmly clings to Christ. He is and will ever remain regenerated, pleasing to God, the child of God and heir of heaven. Faith, which alone can justify, is also the only requisite and means of obtaining salvation. Neither repentance nor penance, neither love of God nor work, good works, nor any other virtue is required, though in the just they may either attend or follow as a result of justification. And I'm skipping a little bit. Since neither charity nor good works contribute anything towards justification, inasmuch as faith alone justifies their absence subsequently cannot deprive the just man of anything whatever. There is only one thing that might possibly divest him of justification, namely the loss of fiduciary faith or faith in general. From this point of view, we get a, great, a physiological, psychological explanation of the numerous objectionable passages in Luther's writings against which even Protestants with deep moral sense, such as Hugo, Hugo Grotius and George Bull, earnestly protested. Thus we find in one of Luther's letters written to Melanchthon in 1521 with the following sentence, Be a sinner and sin boldly, but believe and rejoice in Christ more strongly, who triumphed over sin, death, and the world. As long as we live in here, we must sin. As long as we live here, we must sin. Could anyone do more to degrade St. Paul's concept of justification than Luther did in the following blasphemy? If adultery could be committed in faith, it would not be a sin. The doctrine of justification by faith alone was considered by Luther and his followers as an incontrovertible dogma, as the foundation rock of the Reformation, as an article by which the church must stand or fall, 
and which of itself would have been a sufficient cause for beginning the Reformation, as the Smalkaldic articles emphatically declare. Thus we need not wonder when later on we see Lutheran theologians declaring that sola fide's doctrine, as the principal material of, the Protest of Protestantism, deserves to be placed beside uh, with the doctrine side by side with the doctrine of sola scriptura, the Bible alone, with the exclusion of tradition, as its principum formulae. Two maxims in which the contrast between Protestant and Catholic teaching reaches its highest point. Since, however, neither maxim can be found in the Bible, every Catholic is forced to conclude that Protestantism is from its very beginning and foundation is based on self-deception. We assert this of Protestantism in general, for the doctrine of justification as defined by the Reformed churches differs only in non-essentials from Lutheranism. The most important of these differences is to be found in Calvin's system, which taught that only such as are predestined infallibly to eternal salvation obtain justification, whilst in those not predestined God produces a mere appearance of faith and righteousness, and this in order to punish them more severely in hell. So, I think that's a good article. You're certainly able to, uh, to look it up and get it for yourself. And I think it is a good description of the Protestant view of justification. But you can see there that one of the big problems is the idea that we don't actually become righteous. We, our, our righteousness is, uh, is actually still incomplete. It is, uh, we are still sinful people, but, but Jesus' righteousness counts on our behalf and covers our sin. And that's what the problem he has, is that God is declaring us to be just when we are really not just. That's one of the big problems that you see in that article from the Catholic perspective. But I think it is a good summation of the uh, Protestant view of justification. So that's, um, that's that part. Let's continue with our discussion of justification. And I'm sure we'll have uh, questions and further discussion in class about this. Um, biblical terms for justification in the Old Testament. Uh, we see Sadiq. The hypho form of the verb means to declare righteous, to vindicate, or justify. And in the New Testament, dikaiu, pronounce or accept to treat as righteous as a declaration is the antithesis of condemnation. And uh, it's noted here that the verb essentially has a forensic, uh, it's a forensic type verb in biblical uses. It's uh, basically a sentence of acquittal, so a kind of a legal aspect, which is what we're talking about in forensic aspect, uh, things here. So it is more of a declaration rather than about uh, re the uh, ontology of a person. We do have a bit of a dilemma in the biblical text. In Isaiah, Isaiah 5.23, a woe is pronounced on those who justify the wicked. Uh, in Proverbs 17.15, he who justifies the wicked and who condemns the just, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. But isn't that exactly what God is doing? So in Isaiah and in the Proverbs text, do we have an issue? So if God is saying that we are just when we are not, then is are we having some issues here with the text? We uh, see have three facts here that we just want to um, uh, focus on here in our understanding is that uh, humans are sinful, God is holy and righteous, and God's law is is permanent; it's not uh, uh, transient, so it doesn't change. So how does God do the very thing that He hates? Well, we have a solution here provided for us in Romans. Paul explains how God can be both uh, both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So uh, here we see from just passages, all these references are to Romans. Uh, these Romans passages, we have no righteousness with which to face a righteous God. We have no hope in the law. And you see those scripture references. We're just going to go through them pretty quickly. But God's righteousness is available by grace, apart from works, free but not cheap, as in appropriated by faith. We have those references here. The work of Christ declares God's righteousness while revealing his grace. Salvation by grace leaves no room for boasting. Salvation by grace is nothing new. Uh, we've seen examples of that in, with Abraham 
David and Abraham, not Abraham, um, with David and Abraham. So uh, we can see that that that's one way we can overcome this this claim that God is uh, violating what He said here um, by what we see in Romans. Um, as uh, we are going to look at a quick summary of justification, the essence. Um, of justification, to, to justify means to declare just, not to become just. It's not a process, but an act of God. Justification has two elements, a negative and positive, just like with um, conversion where there was a negative and positive aspect of, of leaving sin and self and turning to God. Here the negative is we are freed from the penalty of the law, which is, is not a, a negative isn't a bad thing, but it's a negative as in what we are leaving. We are leaving the penalty of the law Positively, we are going toward or being restated into position of divine, divine um, favor and privilege. The basis of justification is Jesus Christ and his work. Um, Romans 3.24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So that is why we are justified. It has nothing to do with our ability to save ourselves. It's what Jesus has done. The condition for justification is faith, Romans 4, 5, but him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. So we see that faith is required and it is the basis on which we are declared righteous. The results of justification, objective and subjective peace with God. Uh, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 5, one. So we have a relationship with God, and then we have a declaration of our righteousness. Next, we'll turn to sanctification. A couple of definitions of sanctification. We have Wayne Grudem. Sanctification is a progressive work of God and man that makes us more and more free from sin and like Christ in our actual lives. In the Concise Dictionary of Christian Theology, defines sanctification as the divine act of making the believer actually holy, that is, bringing the person's moral condition into conformity with the legal status established in justification. So you can see here a clear splitting of justification from sanctification in Protestant theology as opposed to Catholic theology. The Westminster Dictionary of theological terms define sanctification is to make holy by purifying from sin. Quite simple. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, second edition, does not actually have an entry for sanctification. What they have an entry for is sanctifying grace. And that is described as the grace which heals our human nature wounded by sin by giving us a share of, in the divine life of the Trinity. It is, an, a, it is a habitual supernatural gift which continues the work of sanctifying us, of making us perfect, holy, and Christ-like. <clears throat> With that, we have a definition of justification here from the Catechism. The gracious action of God, which frees us from sin, communicates the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Justification is not only the remission of sins, but also the sanctification and renewal of the interior man. So, again, just stressing the idea that the Catholic view keeps justification, sanctification, and regeneration together. Views of sanctification... Uh, we can see sanctification as justification, and that's what we see uh, with Pelagian views and also a Catholic view here. So Pelagius uh, denies inherited sin, and uh, we sees Jesus more as a demonstration of how, what we are to do, and that we should follow and model what Jesus did, and that is both justification, sanctification. The Catholic position is that, as we've seen at Trent, uh, the Council of Trent treated sanctification under the heading of justification. Thus, the good works which he performs through the grace of God and the merits of Jesus Christ doth merit increase of grace, eternal life, and the attainment of that eternal life. So, again, the Catholic position does not separate sanctification and justification. In liberal theology, uh, Rauschenbusch teaches the social gospel and uh, 
sanctification is seen as communal rather than individual there. So you see that's why the transformation of society is much more important for the groups that have bought into a view of sanctification as um, tied up with the social gospel movement. So the understanding of salvation is different, of course. So their effort, their efforts and their um, interests in church life are different. Liberation theology sees sanctification as a change brought about on behalf of the poor and oppressed. This is many, the view of many feminist theologies and black theologies. And James Cone is a um, black liberation theologian. So um, liberation theology sees it again as societal rather than individual, but it is particularly on oppressed groups is the uh, purpose there. A Wesleyan um, holiness tradition is more of a crisis model of sanctification. Uh, we see here, uh, by an instantaneous second work of grace, the second blessing, the believer is perfected. So long as he believes in the gospel through Jesus Christ and loves him and is pouring out his heart before him, he cannot voluntarily transgress any command of God, either by speaking or action, what he knows God has forbidden. See, that's attributed to Wesley there. Um, and Finney notes that Paul nowhere confesses sin after he became an apostle. So you have an idea of a sinless perfection that uh, can be attained if you are in right relation with God, if you have had this second blessing. So that is um, another view. That's the Wesleyan view. You also have um, some Pentecostal views of sanctification. The, uh, the holiness Pentecostal holiness movement um, has a Wesleyan belief in a second act of grace. Um, and this, from the discipline of the Pentecostal Holiness Church, we believe that the entire sanctification is an instantaneous, definite second work of grace obtainable by faith on part of the fully justified. So that leaves in the idea that those who have not received that are not completely justified. And the Assemblies of God deny the second work destroys inbred sin. However, the baptism of the Spirit empowers the believers to holiness otherwise not possible. And the baptism is evidenced by speaking in tongues. So we can see this idea of conversion, yet another action which is um, after conversion in which the sanctification is either completed or it is greatly improved in both of these traditions. Then we have a Keswick tradition and uh, another crisis type of model. Uh, through a decisive act of surrender to Christ, the believer experiences the power to live a life of victory. The Christian passively, let, passively experiences victory in abiding in Christ. And you have kind of the phrase, let go and let God. Any victory that you have to get by trying for it is counterfeit. If you have to work for your victory, it's not the real thing. It's not the thing that God offers you. A victory gained by gradual conquest over evil, getting one sin after another out of your life is a counterfeit victory. The Lord Jesus does not give us any such gradual victory over the sins in your life. And we see Turnbull here um, is being quoted in that regard. So the idea that everything is going to happen if you just uh, release and um, give yourself over to God and that you will have that complete and total victory. And so sanctification is this moment at which it happens subsequent to your salvation experience. So it's after salvation. And sanctification is completed in one of these different, um, very definite and very, um, very clear moments. Is this is what's saying here that you're, you're working up to this crisis moment, and once that happens, uh, sanctification is completed, or at least it is very, very quickly advanced. And there's a rejection, in particular here in this tradition of incremental growth in salvation. And what is going on here? I don't know if or not.
continuing after uh, some technical issues. We saw the sanctification as a crisis model. Now we're going to look at sanctification as an initial and gradual process. This is a Reformed or Evangelical view. And uh, the quote we have here is, The gracious act of God wherein he sets us apart initially and continually for himself. This model differs in that there is a positional aspect of salvation, we would call justification. <clears throat> so there's something definitely that starts at the point of conversion, but then the process of growth over time is more gradual, and we will uh, we'll look at this here. Uh, at 1 Corinthians 6.11, we see that this first aspect, or this positional state to which we are put into, uh, we're going to see that. As and such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So at the moment of salvation, believers are set apart, apart from the world unto God. There is an aspect of that that's justification. And then there's an aspect of this beginning of the sanctification process. But that's not all. It continues. Um, in Ephesians 5.26... We read that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word. So there's an ongoing process of growth and sanctification. And at times, as we see here, these, these two senses create a tension. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 1-2, we find to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. So there's a there is sometimes a sense of we are progressing or we are being sanctified, but we're also looked at as being completely sanctified already, or being complete. So there's an aspect that we're traveling through it, but we are seen as being sanctified as well. Looking at some of the biblical terms for the concept of sanctification, in the Old Testament we have Kadesh, uh, which means to be consecrated, be holy, uh, from the root word kod, which means to cut or separate. So it has to do with the uh, the contractual aspects there. You would cut a covenant when you were uh, making a covenant. So there's uh, definitely some forensic references. In the New Testament, hagazio means separate or set apart. So the idea of sanctification means to be separate or different to be special, probably, uh, in, in the sense that we have uh, the idea of common and holy, and we are to be separate from the common. Uh, the Christian in the Mosaic Law, Romans 10.4, of course, Christ is the end of the law. It gives us instruction, but believers are not under the Old Testament law the way the Jews were. And we will sometimes have interesting discussions that arise from this aspect when people assume that, well, we w must hold to all of the different uh, dietary restrictions and uh, clothing restrictions and, and all of these other Old Testament laws. Christians are not Jews. We are Christians. And we are not under the law the same way the Jewish people were. Now, we respect the law, we learn from the Old Testament, we don't jettison it, we don't throw it away. At the same time, we are not bound to it. And we see uh, certain denominations, particularly uh, I've had interaction, interactions with Seventh-day Adventists that um, want to enforce Old Testament law on Christians, and so they avoid pork and uh, some other things like that. But that's, um, that's difficult to justify when we understand that Jesus fulfilled the law and uh, we are not related to the law the same way that the Jews were. Um, now, another issue that we'll talk about is the idea of a carnal Christian. And um, we can uh, understand that sanctification is a process 
and that sometimes we don't do as well as we should. So we are, uh, Christians are not exempt from acting in the flesh, which is what carnality is, is referring to. And uh, we see here in 1 Corinthians that Paul is not talking about two different classes of Christians, however. Uh, a couple other things we want to look at just quickly as we're, we're trying to get to the end of this. And this lecture has had some technical difficulties, so I hope it's come together pretty clearly. Um, looking at Romans 7, 15 through 23, uh, we're going to look at some ways of taking that passage. I'll read uh, Romans 7, 15 through 23 for us. And this is from the Holman Christian Standard. For I do not understand what I am doing, because I do not practice what I want to do, but I do what I hate. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree with the law that it is good. So now I am no longer the one doing it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my flesh. For the desire to do what is good is with me, but there is no ability to do it. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but I practice the evil that I do not want to do. Now, if I do not, if I do what I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it. But it is the sin that lives in me. So I discover this principle. When I want to do good, evil is with me. For in my inner self, I joyfully agree with God's law. But I see a different law in the parts of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and taking me prisoner to the law of the sin in the parts of my body. So what is Paul talking about here? Is this pre-conversion? Is this post-conversion? Uh, there are arguments for both sides here. And we're, we're quoting Schreiner there. Um, uh, Continuing with another quote, I, I would suggest that the arguments are so finely balanced because Paul does not intend to distinguish believers from unbelievers in this text. Paul reflects on whether the law has the ability to transform human beings, concluding that it does not. So, as it relates to what's going on with, nice to get notifications, with Romans 7 is... This text has arguments both ways, whether or not this is a pre- or post-conversion thing. Is this dealing with coming to salvation, or is this struggling with sanctification? And if we try to read it one of those two ways, uh, I, I agree with Shiner here that probably what the effect is, or what the point of the passage is, that the law cannot save. The law does not transform people. And so we struggle with it. And it's probably not a theological reflection on a pre- or post-conversion aspect. One of the things that you would have learned in your hermeneutics classes is you've got to be asking the right questions of the text. You've got to try to understand the text in the context it was written, trying to address the issues the author was dealing with, and it's not legitimate to take a different issue and try to force the text to answer an issue that it was never intended to answer. So that may be the case here. Uh, but what about sinless perfection? Another issue, um, Matthew 5:48. Therefore you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So how are we to do that? In Philippians 3, 12 and 15, Paul stated he had not yet been made perfect, but he did consider himself to be perfect, in verse 15, in the sense of being spiritually mature. So how are we to be perfect uh, when even Paul wasn't perfect? A quote from Luther we have here, You will most certainly never attain sinless perfection here on earth, otherwise you would have further, no further need of faith in Christ. So Luther certainly sees... The idea that we are never going to make make the uh, the attainment of spiritual perfection in this life, and I think that uh, that he is right. Though uh, why he's right, may we may discuss a little bit there. But certainly, uh, it is the case that we're not going to be completely 
mature, but we're called, or mature, rather perfect, but we're called to be uh, complete. And that's uh, another issue with the idea of perfection has to do with completeness. Um, so, in one sense, we are complete in that we have all of God, and eventually we will be uh, fully sanctified, but at the same time, we are not completely sanctified at the moment. The purpose of the spiritual disciplines, some other, uh, some aspects kind of going on to this. So, what, how do spiritual disciplines play into sanctification? Um, we have a couple of conceptions that, uh, well, we have a new nature, a new uh, regenerated self in a believer, but we also are not completely eliminated from the rebellious nature, or we're not separated, rather, from the rebellious nature of the flesh. So we have something of a struggle with within each of us. We have a tendency, a desire to, um, to do things that are sinful and a desire to please God. And these don't always go together very well. So um, looking at Galatians 5.17, for the sinful nature desires what is contrary to spirit and spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature and they are conflict with each other. So that you do not do what you want. So we see the idea here that we don't always, uh, we don't have perfect control over ourselves. We have some struggle. In 1 Peter 2.11, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against your soul. So we don't do what we want in Galatians, but Peter here is telling us don't do those things. So if he's telling us not to do them, then we must have some control over them. So, this is where the whole spiritual disciplines can come in to being. Uh, we are to advance in becoming more like Christ by effort and struggle and warfare and suffering and divine chastening, as we see these references, these scripture references here. And one ways we, some of the ways Christians have done that is by participating in different disciplines that help in that regard. So things like praying and scripture reading and scripture memorization and journaling and um, and fasting, which Baptists don't like to talk about. And those kind of, of things are ways to help us become more mature and to uh, strive uh, or abstain from the lusts, like Peter says, fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. The disciplines are not an end to themselves, but they are a means by which we are trained. The Holy Spirit helps us to uh, be more in control of ourselves. So like anything, discipline gives us the ability to do things that we couldn't do without it. And that brings us to the end of our presentation. I'm sorry this one is choppy. I'm going to try to splice it all together. And hopefully it will come together well, and we'll see you in the next one.